suppose he refuses to be hunted. Oh, said the general, I give him his options, of course. He need not play that game if he doesn't wish to. If he does not wish to hunt, I turn him over to Ivan. Ivan once had the honor of serving as an official nodder to the great white czar. I don't know her. And has his own ideas of sport. And invariably, Mr. Rainsford, invariably they choose to hunt. Invariably. Variable. Yeah. And if they win, they smile and the general's face widen. To date, I have not lost, he said. Then he added hastily, I don't wish to think me a braggart. Mr. Rainsford, many of them afford only the most elementary sort of problem. Occasionally, I'll strike a Tartar. One almost did win. I eventually had to use the dogs. The dogs? This way. Please, I'll show you. The general steered Rainsford to a window. The lights from the window sent a flickering illumination that had grotesque patterns on the courtyard below and Rainsford could see moving about there moving about there a dozen or so huge black shapes as they turned toward him, their eyes glittering greenly. A rather good lot, I think, observed the general, and there are let out at they are let out at seven every night if anyone tries if anyone should try to get out, should try to get into my house or out of it, something extremely regrettable would occur to them. Their eyes glittered greenly. A rather good lot, I think, observed the general. They're let out at seven every night. If anyone should try to get into my house or out of it, something extremely regrettably would occur to them. He hummed a snatch of a song from the Follies Berger. And now, said the general, I, will, I want to show you my new collection of heads. Will you come with me to the library? I hope so, said Rainsford. That will excuse that you will that. Uh, I hope so, said Rainsford, that you will excuse me tonight, General Zarov. I'm really not feeling well. Ah, indeed, the general inquired. So, maliciously? Saliciously? Ah, indeed, the general inquired saliciously. Well, I suppose that's only natural after your long swim. You'll need a good rest. You'll need a good restful night's sleep. Tomorrow you'll feel like a new man. I'll wager. Then we'll hunt. Ah, uh, I've one rather promising prospect. Rainsford was hurrying from his, the room. I'm sorry you can't go with me tonight, called the general. I expect rather fair sport. Big game. Strong black. Sorry, I, you can't go with me tonight, called the general. I expect rather fair sport. Big, strong, black. He looks resourceful. Well, good night, Mr. Rainsford. I hope you have a good night's rest. The bed was good, and the pajamas of the softest silk he has 
tried in every fiber of his being, but never... The bed was good and the pajamas of the softest silk, and he was tired in every fiber of his being, but nevertheless Rainsford could not qu quiet his brain with the opate of sleep. He lay eyes wide open. Once he thought he heard stealthy steps in the corridor outside his room, he sought to throw open the door. It would not open. He went to the window and looked out. His room was high up in one of the towers. The lights of the chateau were out now, and it was dark and silent, but there was a fragment of shallow moon, and by its wan light he could see dimly the courtyard. There, weaving in and out in the pattern of shadow, were black, noiseless forms. The hounds heard him at the window and looked up, expectantly with their green eyes. Rainsford went black to the bed, went back to the bed and lay down. By many methods, he had tried to put himself to sleep. He had achieved only a dozen when just a morning began to come. He heard far off in the jungle the faint reports of pistol. General Zaroff did not appear until luncheon. <clears throat> he was dressed faultlessly in the tweeds of country squire. He solicitous about he was solicitous about the status statue of Rainsford's health. As for me, sighed the general, I do not feel so well. I am worried. Mr. Rainsford. Last night I detected a trace of my old complaint. To Rainsford's questioning glance, the general said, Inu boredom. Inu? Inu boredom? I don't know. When taking a second helping of crepes, crepes, Suzette? The general explained, the hunting was not good last night. I think it's time for another dabby. The hunting wasn't good. Oh, jeez. I'm not stoned enough for this. It's too sober. confusing at the beginning but uh, it's kind of awkward it was kind of awkward I feel like to start with but finally getting down to like a not like a bead or a pattern but just more comfortable and just kind of allows me to take in the material, understand it better, I guess. Um,
guess it's just a little more enjoyable now. <coughs> characters when they're on the boat Rainsford and Whitney there's kind of like a struggle to fucking separate them and everything <coughs> keep going Then taking a second helping of Crepe, Suzette, the general explained, the hunting was not good last night. The fellow lost his head. He made a straight trail that offered no problems at all. That's the trouble with these sailors. They have dull brains to begin with, and they do not know, know how to get out of the woods. They do excessively stupid and obnoxious things. It's most annoying. You will have you will another glass of Shabbly, Mr. Rainsford. General said Rainsford firmly, I wish to leave the island at once. The general raised his thicket of eyebrows. He seemed hurt. But my dear fellow, the general protested, you've only just come and you've had no hunting. I wish to go today, said Rainsford. He saw the dead black eyes of the general on him, studying him. General Zaroff's face suddenly brightened. He fulfilled Rainsford's glass with venerable Chablais from the dusty bottle. I don't even know if I'm saying that shit right. Tonight, the general, will you, we will hunt you. Tonight, the general... Tonight, said the general, we will hunt, you and I. Rainsford shook his head. No, general, he said. I will not hunt. The general shrugged his shoulders and delicately ate hot house grape. As you wish, my friend, he said. The choice rests entirely with you. But I may not venture to suggest that you will find my idea of sport more diverting than Ivan's. He nodded toward the corner to where the giant stood, scrolling his scrolling, scowling, scowling his thick arms across his hog's head of a chest. Don't you mean, cried Rainsford, my dear fellow, said the general, have I not told you I always mean what I say about hunting? This is really an inspiration. I drink to foemen worthy of my steel, at least. The general raised his glass, but to Rainsford sat staring at him. Sat staring at him. You'll find this game worth playing, said the general, said You'll find this game worth playing, the general said, enthusiastically, your brain against mine, your woodcraft against mine, your strength and stamina against mine. Outdoor chess and stake is not without value, huh? And if I win, began Rainsford huskily, I'll cheerfully acknowledge my defeat if I do not find you by the night of the third day. said General Zara. My slope will place you in the midland near town. The general read what Rainsford was thinking. Oh, you can trust me, said the Cossack. I will give you my word as a gentleman and as a sportsman, of course, your turn. You must agree to say nothing of your visit here. I'll agree to nothing of the kind, said Rainsford. Oh, said the general, in that case, but why discuss that now? 
three days hence we can discuss it over a bottle of veno pluto Cle clenon i have no idea it's some like french bullshit veno cle coup quo cle quo then Vuve, Vuve, Cluco, Cle, Click, Cle, Clicku, Click on, ah, fuck this bullshit. <clears throat> the general sipped his wine. Then a business like air animated him. Ivan, he said to Rainsford. We'll supply you with hunting clothes, food, a knife. I suggest you wear moccasins. They'll leave poorer trail. I suggest, too, that you avoid the big swamp in the southeast corner of the island. We call it Death Swamp. There's quicksand there. One foolish fellow tried it. The deplorable part of it was that Lazarus followed him. You can imagine my feelings, Mr. Rainsford. I loved Lazarus. He was the finest hound in my pack. Well, I must beg you to excuse me now. I always take a siesta after lunch. A siesta? Siesta? I don't know. What the fuck is a siesta? You'll hardly have time for a nap, I fear. You'll want to start, no doubt. I shall not follow until dusk. Hunting at night is so much more exciting than by day. Don't you think? Au revoir, Mr. Rainsford. Au revoir. Fucking rich white people. So I, I guess he's Russian. It's Russian, so they, why can't they just speak English? You know? General Zaroff with a deep curling blow. I was, I was just joking. This shit's from like 1920 or something. Really, it's interesting. I just, all this shit that I just thought. See, so this is what happens when you read, you don't know. General Zaroff, with a deep and curdling bow, strolled off to the room. Strolled off from the room. <clears throat> from another door came Ivan. Under one arm he carried khaki hunting clothes, harbor sack of food, haver, haver sack of food, a leather sheet, containing a long-bladed hunting knife. His right hand rested on a cocker, cocked revolver thrust in the crimson sash about his waist. Uh, yeah. Rainsford had fought his way through the brush for two hours. I must keep my nerve, I must keep my nerve said through the right through tight teeth. He had not been entirely clear headed when the chateau gates snapped shut behind him. His whole idea first was to put distance between himself and General Zaroff. And to this end he had plunged plugged plunged plunged Plugged, not plugged, plunged along, spurred on by the sharp rowers of something very panicked, he said. Wow. Okay, he had not been entirely clear headed when the chateau gate snapped shut behind him. His whole idea, at first, was to put distance between himself and General Zara. And to this end, he had plunged, 
along, spurred on by the sharp rowers of something very like panic. Now he had got a grip on himself, had stopped, and was taking stock of himself and the situation. He saw that straight light was he saw that straight light was futile. Inevitably it would bring him face to face with the sea. He was in a pitcher with a frame of water. He was in a he was in a pitcher with a frame of water, and his operations clearly must take place within that frame. I'll give him a trail to follow, muttered Ransford, and then he struck off from the rude part from the rude path he had he had been following into the trackless wilderness. He executed a series of intricate loops. He doubled on his trail again and again, recalling all the lore of the fox hunt and all the dodges of the fox. Night found him leg weary with hands and face lashed by the branches on a thickly wooded ridge. He knew it would be insane to blunder on through the dark, even if he had the strength he needed for rest was imperative, and he thought he must have played fox. He thought, I have played the fox, now I must play the cat to the fable. The big tree with a thick trunk outspread branches was nearby. And taking care to not taking care to leave not the slightest mark, he climbed up into the crouch and stretched out on the on one of the broad limbs after a fashion rested after a fashion rested. Rest brought him a new confidence and most and almost a feeling of security. Even so, a zealous hunter as General Zaroff could not trace him there. He told him only the dev devil himself could follow that complicated trail through the jungle after dark, but perhaps the general was a devil. An apprehensive night crawled slowly like a wounded snake. An apprehensive night crawled slowly by like a wounded snake, and sleep did not visit Rainsford, although the silence of the dead world was on the jungle. Toward the morning when a dinghy di toward the morning when a dingy gray was varnishing the sky. The cry of some startled bird focused Rainsford's attention in that direction. Something was coming through the brush, coming slowly, carefully, coming by the same winding way Rainsford had come. He had flattened himself down <coughs> on that limb, and through a screen of leaves almost as thick as tapestry he watched. That which was approaching was a man. It was General Zaroff. He had made his way along with his eyes fixed in utmost concentration on the ground before him. He paused almost beneath the tree, dropped to his knees, and studied the ground. Rainsford's impulse was to hurl himself down like a panther, but he saw that the General's right hand had held something metallic. A small automatic pistol. The hunter shook his head several times as if he were puzzled, and then he straightened up and looked straightened up and took from his case one of his black cigarettes, and its pungent, incense like smoke floated up to
to Ransford's nostrils. Ransford held his breath. The general's eyes had left the ground and were traveling inch by inch up the tree. Ransford froze. There, every muscle tensed for a spring, but the sharp eyes of the hunter stopped before they reached the limb where Ransford lay. A smile spread over his brown face. Very deliberately, he blew his smoke ring into the air. Then he turned his back on the tree and walked carelessly away back along the trail he had come. The swish of the underbrush against his hunting boots grew fainter and fainter. The pent-up air burst hoitly, hotly from Rainsford's lungs. His first thought made him feel sick and numb. The general could follow a trail through the woods at night. He could follow an extremely difficult trail. He must have uncanny powers. Only by the merest chance of the Cossack, only by the merest chance had the Cossack failed to see his quarry. Rainsford's second thought was even more terrible. It sent, it sent a shudder of cold horror through his whole being. Why had the general smiled? Why had he turned back? Ransford did not want to believe what his reason told him was true, but the truth was evident, as the sun had now pushed through the morning mist. The general was playing with him. The general was saving him for another, another's, another day's sport. The Cossack was the cat, and he was the mouse. Then it was that Rainsford knew the full meaning of terror. I will not lose my nerve. I will not. He slid down the tree and struck off again into the woods. His face was set, and he forced the machinery of his mind to function. 300 yards from his hiding place, he stopped where a huge tree, where a huge dead tree, leaned precariously on a smaller living one. Throwing off his sack of food, Rainsford took his knife from its sheath and began to work with all his energy. The job was finished at last, and he threw himself behind, threw himself down behind a falling fallen log a few hundred feet away. He did not have to wait long. The cat was coming again to play with the mouse. It's the story is almost over, puppy. All right, the cat was coming to play with the mouse. Following the trail with the success of the bloodhounds came General Zara. Nothing escaped those searching black eyes. No crushing blade of grass. No bent twig, no mark. No matter how faint in the moss, so intent was the Cossack. So intent was the Cossack on his stalking that he was upon the thing Rainsford had made before he saw it. His foot touched the protruding burrow that was the trigger. Even as he touched it, the general sensed his danger and leapt back with the agility of an ape. But not but he was not quite quick enough. The dead tree delicately adjusted to the rest on the cut living one. Crashed down and struck the general a glancing blow on the shoulder as it fell. Okay, kind of lost. Okay, but he was 
not quite quick enough. The dead tree delicately adjusted to rest on the cut living one crashed down and struck the general at a glancing bow in the shoulder as it fell, but for his alertness he must have been smashed beneath it. He staggered, but he did not fall, nor did he drop his revolver. He stood there, rubbing his injured shoulder, and Ransford, with fear again gripping his heart, heard the general's mocking laugh ring through the jungle. Rainsford called the general. If you're within the sound of my voice, I suppose you are. Let me congratulate you. Not many men know how to make a melee man-catcher. Luckily for me, I too have hunted in Malacca. You're proving interesting, Mr. Rainsford. I'm going now to have my wounded have my wound dressed it's only a slight one but i shall be back i shall be back when the general nursing his bruised soldier had gone rainsford took up the fight again it was flight now a desperate hopeless flight that carried him on for the for some hours dusk came then darkness and still he pressed on the ground grew softer for his moccasins the vegetation grew ranker denser insects bit him more savagely then he stepped forward his foot sank into the ooze he tried to wrench it back but the mud the muck sucked vigorously at his foot as if a as if it were a giant leech with violent effort, he tore his feet loose. He knew where he was now. Death swamp in its quicksand. His hands were tight crossed as if his nerves were something tangible that were that someone in the darkness was trying to tear from his grip. The softness of the earth had given him an idea. He had stepped back from the quicksand a dozen feet or so, like some huge prehistoric beaver, he began to dig. Rainsford began to dig himself in, in, in France, when a second delay meant death. Rainsford had dug himself in, in France, when a second delay meant death. That had been placid pastime compared to digging that. The pit grew deeper. When it was above his shoulders, he climbed out and from some hard sapling cut stakes and sharpened them into fine points. These stakes he planted in the bottom of the pit with the points sticking up with Flying fingers, he wore a rough carpet of he wove with flying fingers. He wove a rough carpet of weeds and branches, and with it covered the mouth of the pit. Then, wet with sweat and aching with tiredness, he crouched behind the stump of a lightning-charred tree. He knew his pursuer was coming. He had heard the padding sound of feet on soft earth. And the night breeze brought him the perfume of the general's cigarette. And it seemed to Rainsford that the general was coming with unusual swiftness. He had not feelings this way. He had, he was not feeling this way long. Foot by foot, Rainsford crouched. Rainsford, crouching there, could not see General, could not see the General, nor could he see the pit. He was living a year and a minute. Then he felt a pulse. He felt an impulse to cry aloud with joy, for he heard the sharp crackle of the breaking branches. As the cover of the pit gave way, he heard a sharp scream of pain as the pointed stakes found their 
mark. He left up from his... Excuse me. Okay. Rainsford crouching there could not see the general, nor could he see the pit. He lived a year a minute. Then he felt an impulse to cry aloud with joy. For he heard the sharp crackle of breaking branches as the cover of the pit gave way. He heard the sharp scream of pain as the pointed stakes found their mark. He leapt up from his place of concealment. Then he cowered back. Three feet away from the pit was a man was three feet away from the pit a man was standing with an electric torch in his hand. You've done well, Rainsford, the voice of the general called. The Burmese tiger pit was claimed one of my best dogs. Again, you score. I think Mr. Rains. Uh, your Burmese tiger pit has claimed one of my best dogs. Again, you score. I think Mr. Rainsford, I'll see what you can do against my whole pack. I'm going home for a rest now. Thank you for the most amusing evening. At daybreak, Rainsford lied near the swamp as awakened by a sound that made him know that he had new things to learn about fear. It was a distant sound, faint and wavering, but he knew it. It was the baying of a pack of hounds. Rainsford knew he could do one of two things. He could stay where he was and wait. That was suicide. He could flee. That was postponing the inevitable. And for a moment, he stood there thinking an idea had that held a wild chance that came to him. And tightening his belt, he headed away from the swamp. The baying of hounds drew near, then still nearer, nearer, ever nearer. On a ridge, Rainsford climbed a tree. Rainsford. Down a water course, not a quarter of a mile away, he could see a bush moving. Straining his eyes, he saw the leaning figure of General Zara. Ahead of him, Rainsford made out another figure whose wide shoulders surged through the tall jungle weed. It was the giant Ivan, and I've seen, and he seemed pulled forward by some unseen force. Rainsford knew that Ivan must be holding the pack in leash. They would be on him any minute now, his mind working frantically. He thought of a native trick that he learned in Uganda. He slid down the tree. He caught hold of a springing young sapling, and to it he fastened a, his hunting knife with a blade pointing down the trail with a bit of wild grapevine tied it back to the sapling. Then he ran for his life. The hounds raised their voice as they hit the fresh scent. Rainsford knew now how an animal at bay feels. He had to stop to get his breath. The bang of the handle stopped abruptly and Rainsford's heart stopped too. They must have reached the knife. He shinned excitingly up, sh shinned excitingly up a tree and looked back. His pursuers had stopped, but he had stopped, but the hope that but the hope that was in Rainsford's brain was the hope that was in Rainsford's brain when he climbed died, for he saw in the shadow val shallow valley that General Zaroff was still on his feet. But Ivan was not. The knife driven 
by the recoil of the springing tree had not wholly failed. Okay. So he tied the knife to a tree. And then, yeah, the tree fucking... I got you. Rainsford had hardly tumbled to the ground when the packs took up the cry again. Nerve, 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 he panted. As he dashed along, the blue gap showed between the trees dead ahead. The blue gap showed between the trees dead ahead. Ever nearer drew the hounds. Rainsford, Rainsford forced himself on toward that gap. He reached it. It was the shore of the sea. Across the cove, he could see the gloomy gray stone of the chateau. Twenty feet below him, the sea rumbled and hissed. Rainsford hesitated. He heard the hounds. He leapt far out to sea. Then when general, then when the general and his pack reached the Palace by the sea, the Cossack stopped. For minutes, he stood regarding the blue-green expanse of water. He shrugged his shoulders, then he sat down and took a drink of brandy from the silver flask, lit a cigarette, hummed a bit from Madame Butterfly. General Zaroff had exceedingly good dinner in his great paneled dining hall that evening. With it, he had a bottle of Paul Roger and half a bottle of Chambertine. Two slight annoyances kept him from perfect enjoyment. One was the thought that it would be difficult to replace Ivan and the other was that his quarry had escaped him. Of course, the American hadn't played the game, so so thought the general as he tasted his after-dinner liquor. In his library, he read to soothe himself for the works of Marcus Aurelius. At ten, he went up to his bedroom, was deliciously tired, he said to himself as he talked himself in. There was a little moonlight before, so... So he's, he's just going to try and fucking swim off? was a little moonlit, so before turning on his light, he went on to the window, looked down at the courtyard. He could see the great hounds. He called better luck next time to them. Then he switched on the light. A man who had been hiding in the curtains of the bed was standing there. Rainsford, screamed the general. How in God's name did you get here? Swam, said Rainsford. I found it quicker than walking through the jungle. The general snuck in. The general sucked in his breath and smiled. I congratulate you, he said. You have won the game. Rainsford did not smile. I am still a beast at bay, he said in a low, hoarse voice. Get ready, General Zaroff. The general made one of his deepest bows. I see, he said. Splendid. One of us is to furnish a repast of the hounds? The other will sleep in this very excellent bed, on guard, Rainsford. He had never slept in a better bed, Rainsford decided. What in the fuck was that?
So he just runs and then jumps in the fucking water. And then that's it? He's supposed to w fucking win after that? I would say it's super disappointing. I don't know. The general could have killed him. I'm not sure what, what... So, I even took a knife to the chest. And then... We have to go back and reread that. The first day, what? He uh, just slept in a tree. The second day, he made the trap. And then the third day, I don't, I was kind of confused about the different days. The next day, then what? He left in the water. So, Rainsford is not gonna, like, actually kill him, like, even if he had a gun or something. Because you would think that, like, they're gonna get into a fight or a shootout or a, a, a fist fight, a knife fight, some kind of brawl or something. They don't even do that. It's just, like, a game of chasing cat and mouse, I guess. Kind of like it says. Um, I feel like some of it is like trying to be overly complex and It's like, uh, I feel like when music is, uh, overly produced, it just has like this really clean and polished sound that makes it sound like everything else. And I don't know, that's kind of the idea that I get from this. Just like with the phrasing and this word choice being really specific on lines and things like that. Also, I don't know, something as a hunter, if you're good. If you were to go to like an actual knife smith and then you ask them for a hunting knife, then they they don't really know what to make you. Because there, there's just like, there's not, like hunting knives don't exist, really. You have knives for like gutting and you have knives for skinning. Like the buffalo, the buffalo cape, cape buffalo. Like a cape is like a hide or whatever, right? So you, like within hunting, you just have a different degree of knives. So generally when they talk about a hunting knife, it's just a general purpose knife. It could be like a fucking camping knife. It could be a kitchen knife. Like, hun hunting knives just don't really... It's whatever. And like... I don't know. It's, it's just really annoying. Because it's like... Yeah. So let's stop right there.